Hey everyone, it's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie here again with the Athletes Spine, and we're really excited to have Dr. Scott Zuckerman on with us today. He is a spine surgeon at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and he is also the co-director of the Vanderbilt Sports Concussion Center, as well as the Vanderbilt Spine Outcomes Lab. So Dr. Zuckerman, welcome, uh, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. A real honor to be on. Uh, you guys have quite the following on uh, on YouTube and social media, so I'm really uh, happy to be here. Awesome, and and I think the topic is actually a little bit different and and pretty fun today as well. I and mean, we as orthopedic surgeons really focus on the spine a lot, um, since this is the athlete's spine. But I think we forget that you know a large percentage of the sort of neurologic injuries that occur in, in athletes is actually in the head. And so, you know, Dr. Zuckerman is actually one of the leading experts in concussions in an athletic population. So, you know, we thought about, well, let's talk about that today. So tell us a little bit about your background and sort of your interest in the topic and yeah, educate us. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm a, so as you guys said, I'm a neurosurgeon, but a spine surgeon at Vanderbilt. And I also um, help lead our sports concussion center. And sports concussion is something I've been involved in as even as a late medical student and a resident and throughout my time in attending. Um, and it's a way for me to get my sports fix being a neurosurgeon. Uh, orthopedics is easy, but uh, if you're a sports fan, neurosurgery, you have to work a little harder. So I got and sports concussion has become such a relevant topic uh, these days. It's kind of omnipresent in the media. Uh, there's always a famous athlete. Uh, getting a pretty bad injury out for days and weeks at a time. And it's also a really confusing injury with not a great definition. I remember I went to the concussion and sport group meeting at Berlin about six years ago now and experts from across the world. And they spent about four or five hours arguing about the definition of what a concussion is. I mean, most, most uh, diagnoses in medicine are pretty concrete and black and white. Concussion is a very gray and heterogeneous injury, uh, but it can be frustrating, especially because High-level athletes, pro athletes, college athletes have treated. They look fine on the surface. They're in peak physical form, yet something's off. Their brain isn't working right. They're, they want to get it better. They want to rehab as fast as they can and get back on the field. Uh, but it's just an injury that takes time, and we don't quite have a full understanding of it. So it's been a lot of fun for me to get involved in it, to treat uh, athletes, to do research on the topic, which we've done for at Vanderbilt for over a decade now. Our sports, our concussion center was founded at Vanderbilt by Alan Sills, uh, one of friend and mentor. He's now the chief medical officer of the NFL. Um, so learning from him and setting the stage at Vanderbilt, we've been able to grow and, and treat a lot of um, athletes from all across the Southeast. Yeah, you kind of hit on the very first question that I was going to ask you, which is what, how would you define a concussion? You know, I mean, right now we're in the swing of the NHL playoffs and, uh, you know, hockey is one of those sports, you know, uh, where, where the risk of head injury uh, happening at high velocity is high. And, and for those of us here in, in Seattle, you know, Jared McCann, our leading scorer is out right now with a concussion suffered uh, uh, during a game, uh, you know, with Colorado Avalanche. And so, so how would you actually define concussion for those of us, those of us who hear about that happening, uh, you know, on the, on the, on the field? Yeah. So in every concussion paper we write, we sort of cite the same document, the concussion of sport group that has met for years across international experts neurosurgery, neurology, orthopedic, sports medicine. There's so many disciplines involved. The way they define it is a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces. And it can be a blow anywhere in the body. You can get hit in the chest and if your head jerks back and you, su you suffer neurologic symptoms, uh, it's a concussion. Uh, and has usually has a rapid onset of thankfully short-lived neurologic symptoms. Um, you can have a range of symptoms, something concrete like loss of consciousness, which everyone can see, easy to diagnose or retrograde amnesia or trouble forming new memories or remembering things. Those are concrete signs, but it can also be really great. Like you just, I've seen NFL players who get off the field and they say to their team doc or trainer, I just don't feel right. Uh, and they go to the sideline and they don't pass their concussion test and they're diagnosed with a concussion. So a wide range of symptoms. Another one of the rare concrete things in concussion is that it's got negative standard imaging. So if you get a CT scan or an MRI, it's, it's completely clean. Um, that constitutes a concussion. If you have a little bit of blood on there or a little contusion, that's a higher level of injury that would be, can still be a mild traumatic brain injury, but it's elevated to a structural injury. Which yeah, brings you, I mean, you bring up a really good point. And I think for, for us and a lot of sports fans out there, we hear the term concussion all the time. And like you mentioned, right, we see a lot of different presentations of it, but we've also heard there's a lot of misconceptions, right? People talk so much about concussions and it's hard to sort of decipher what's real and what's not. And yeah. Um, you know, tell us, you know, what are, what, what do we need to keep an eye out for? And 
what, what what's real and what isn't with with this diagnosis? Yeah, definitely. I think the first thing, you know, in the way to describe it, a quick, I think, easy to understand way, it's a functional injury rather than a structural injury. A structural injury, you get a head CT, you see some blood there. That's a structural problem you can see. Concussion has negative imaging, so it's a functional injury, but it very much is a traumatic brain injury. Tra traumatic brain injury. That's a scary term, and that includes big subdural hemorrhages, people being in comas for days or weeks or months, but it also includes a concussion. It's just a very mild form of, tra of a traumatic brain injury. So it is something to be taken very seriously, and it is a, a TBI, traumatic brain injury. So Probably what I'm hearing is that basically, you know, this this can be, this it causes a, a, um, uh, a problem with how the neurons are communicating with one another, but mm -hmm. in the typical imaging modalities that we see, you don't see a problem. I think that's, you know, kind of to lay, you know, to, to make it simple for the lay public. That's, that's what I'm hearing. And I, I would put myself into the lay public yeah. category <laughs> you know, for this diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, basic science studies, what's happening on a cellular level and things, but without getting into that, uh, it's, it's, it's a functional injury. And think of it as, you know, I compare it to patient, uh, patients in the office compared to a laptop. Sometimes your laptop the screen is cracked, the keyboards aren't working, that's a structural injury. But sometimes your laptop, you've had it for a while, it looks fine on the outside, but it takes forever to power up. The battery goes dead in two hours. That's a functional problem, even though it looks fine on the surface. The same thing with concussion. And most concussions get better within about a week or two. Uh, kids maybe a little longer, two or three weeks, but about 10 to 15% can have um, persistent symptoms um, up to a month or more. And there's a series of risk factors for those such as uh, history of headaches, history of migraines, history of um, uh, depression or anxiety. Um, learning disability also can put you at risk for recovery. Um, but thankfully, these are self-limiting. For most people, they're self-limiting injuries that get better in a, in a couple of weeks. Now, one thing that we often hear when an athlete gets injured is that they're on a concussion protocol. Can you mm -hmm. kind of go through what that might mean for an athlete and how or what fans can expect when someone's on a concussion protocol and when they can actually get back to play? Yeah, great question. There's a, there's a concussion support group defines sort of the five or six steps to a process that you have to follow and complete to return to play. And usually uh, the first 48 hours of, of that are just rest. So giving your, giving your body time to recover, not doing a lot of stimulating, stimulating activities. 10, 15 years ago, people used to practice cocoon therapy, which is staying in a dark room for two weeks. We now know that is not what's <laughs> That's no. that actually was found to cause more harm than good because you're socially isolated. You're not doing anything. You're depressed. You're used to being an athlete, going to school, and you're not doing any of those things. So that just exacerbates everything. So, but after about two days, you start what's called active rehabilitation. That what, what we do now, which we weren't doing ten or fifteen years ago, which is going on walks around the neighborhood, maybe um, doing very light aerobic activity, uh, doing some visualization exercises to think about getting back into sport. Those are sort of all the active rehab. Then once you your symptoms start to improve or you're asymptomatic, kind of borderline, very light symptoms or asymptomatic, you start the protocol, uh, which first starts with aerobic exercise, transitions to functional activities like maybe shuttle runs or some higher level aerobic things that are a little more specific to your sport. Then you go to sports specific, specific activities. Then you go to non-contact practice. Then you go to full contact practice. And then you're once you clear each one of those stages without having provocation of symptoms, then you're cleared through the protocol. Yeah, I mean that's that's really nice, and I think that's been well laid out at least from a like a structural standpoint, an algorithmic standpoint, because it seems as though all these major sports have guidelines that sort of follow that protocol. But mm -hmm. can you tell us what is the concern with going back too early? Yeah, why do we even have these protocols? If if someone's you know feeling better within two to three days, why not just send them back on the field at that at that point? Yeah, because a lot a lot of times if you go back a little too early, and also I, I should say we we all think about pro athletes, right? But the majority of these injuries happen in you know middle school and high school students. So anything that we talk before we talk about return to play, we talk about return to learn. Something that's really understudied in the concussion world, not doesn't really apply to pro athletes that get all the attention. Uh, but an athlete in our protocol and most protocols across the, across the country, I think, have to go back to school. Usually starting at a couple hours, then half days, then full days. Then once you're back at school, then you can start the return to play process and hopefully get back to sport. So school is always the first thing. But if you go back too early to your question, uh, Phil, then you can have your symptoms can come back. And that's sort of, I, I tell patients, you take two steps forward with five steps back. So you got to start the whole process again, get your symptoms under control, and then start the return to play. There is a controversial entity known as second impact syndrome where if your brain has not, that's, that's very controversial, described mostly in male American football players. 
that if you go back too early and you suffer another uh, moderate hit or, or severe head injury, your brain loses the ability to auto-regulate, which means control blood flow. You have a massive influx of blood flow to the brain, cerebral edema, and you can actually die from that uh, due to uncontrolled intracranial pressures. Very rare. And like I said, controversial, but that's something that um, is kind of your worst um, oh. thing you will almost. Yeah, that sounds pretty awful. So <laughs> I, can, I, I, I can certainly see, you know, why why uh, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, concern over athletes that get these sorts of injuries and and how we can keep them safe. And, and you bring up the really, really good point that most of these injuries aren't happening in professional athletes. If you look at numbers, you know, these are happening in our kids who are playing soccer and football and hockey and all these sports where head injuries can not only affect their return to sport, but more importantly, their, their ability to get back to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I always say it's not just it's not just football and hockey and soccer that get the most attention. Some less talked about sports can be just as dangerous. I think we did a study a while back on NCAA uh, concussion and wrestling had the highest rate of concussion, mm -hmm. not the highest number of concussion. That was mostly football and hockey, but the highest rate with wrestling. Cheerleading is also really bad. Lacrosse can be dangerous. Equestrian sports as well. So it's more than just football. It's one thing that I, that I like to disseminate. Yeah, well, I mean, this is such a fun topic, and we'll be able to bring it back on again. I think there's like so much that we can discuss over this short time frame, but you know, I think you laid out a really good introduction as to sort of what are the important aspects we need to think about, sort of some of the misconceptions that you know we all consider, and from an anatomic standpoint, to where we always talk about imaging studies, this is really like the lack of a positive finding, and I think that's really important to to discuss with us. But yeah, Dr. Zuckerman, thank you so much for joining us today. It's it a lot of fun. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll definitely have to have you back on another time. You know, Dr. Zuckerman has uh, he's an accomplished spine surgeon and researcher himself, and so uh, we'll we'll have to have you back on to talk about some some spine topics as well. Yeah, anytime. I mean, you guys have done such a great job covering those topics. Hope, hopefully, I can offer something a little different with some uh, brain and uh, concussion information. But uh, I mean, I love this channel. I've watched almost all the videos, and you guys. Uh, it's an honor to be on. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, until next time, uh, Dr. Zuckerman, thanks again. It's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie. Um, be sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram. Take care, everyone.